Our next speaker, Professor Doris Sommer, is the Ira Jewel Williams Professor of Romance, Languages, and Literature, and Professor of African and African American Studies. Sommer has done important research on the 19th century novels that helped consolidate Latin American republics, as well as analyze the aesthetics of minor minoritarian literature. Currently, she is focused on studying the role that the arts and humanities play in developing societies. She is also the director of the Cultural Agency Initiative at Harvard. Please join us in welcoming Professor Doris Sommer. Thank you so much. Um, my smile muscles are still straining from uh, Professor Blitzstein's talk. I'm really grateful for it. Um, the big idea that I want to bring to you tonight is very simple, like many big ideas are, and that is that culture changes the world. And I'm using culture in a particular way uh, it has two general uses. One is the social scientific use that we're familiar with in sociology, anthropology, sometimes in history. And culture is a system. Culture is a, an organism almost that reproduces, changes, evolves, but has some predictability. When humanists and artists use the word culture, it means interruption of that system. It means disruption. It means something new. Another name for art is that which doesn't have a name yet. Immanuel Kant developed that concept of art. It is preconceptual. It can express, communicate, make palpable that which doesn't have a name yet. That's why it's the name of innovation. Without art, it's very hard to think outside of paradigms. So that's, that's the idea. If we want to take on the responsibility, as our host said earlier, to change the world for the better, one of the great opportunities we have is to engage art and humanities. Art because it means change, and humanities because it always offers a twist. I'll give you an example of how they work together. One of our mentors in cultural agents is the ex-mayor of Bogota, Colombia. Does anyone know Antanas Mokus or know of him? Yes, a few people. Well, Mokus is a very strange man. He is a philosopher, a mathematician and uh, was elected mayor of Bogota, Colombia in 1995 when it was the worst city in the hemisphere, maybe in the world. U.S. citizens could travel anywhere in Latin America and count on the State Department's support except for Bogota. You went on your own risk. Children in Bogota in those years, in the late 80s and uh, through the mid-90s, went to school if they had personal bodyguards, and many of them stayed home, were homeschooled, or weren't schooled at all. It was the most chaotic, violent, um, corrupt city in the Americas. And a desperate population elected a strange, nerdly philosophy professor. And he worried for the first month what he would do to make a difference in the city. He asked all of his allies, all of his consultants, all of his secretaries of culture, of education, of transportation, of police. No one came up with a good idea. Finally, his secretary of culture said to Mokus, you know, Antanas, I asked my father-in-law last night what to do in this city, and he said, it's just time to bring out the clowns. Moku stopped a moment and said, that's a great idea. And the next morning, he fired 20 policemen in the center of the city who were traffic cops, corrupt, as many were, and replaced them with pantomime artists, literally making fun of jaywalkers, not giving them tickets. They had no authority, but they made mirth. They used red lights and crosswalks as props for public performance art. Within one year, the traffic deaths had been reduced by more than half, and the statistics kept falling. Mokos made bold 
after that and created one performance art after another in public with the broadest base of citizens he could engage. And in the two administrations uh, that represented Mokos's uh, mayorship, the homicide rate descended by 70%. Income from city taxes increased threefold, and public works took over the city with a new transportation system, better medical care, uh, improved education. What we learned from Mokos and from other great cultural agents is first, that without pleasure, there's no lasting cultural change. There's no lasting political change. Because what happens when you try to force change? You also build resistance and resentment. But pleasure comes from participating, from recognizing your own worth in a collective uh, art form. So Mogus is one of our um, masters and one of our inspirations. Uh, we have several. And at first, Cultural Agents, the initiative that I founded about a dozen years ago, was dedicated to studying these great masters of change through art and through interpretation. Because Mokos says, when I feel stuck, I ask myself, what would an artist do? And then he says, when that doesn't work, I just say to myself, reinterpret. Think of this another way. If you can't change the paradigm, shift your perspective. What humanities brings to art are those shifting perspectives. We can engage various interpretations simultaneously and not have to come down on one right answer. If you think about the need for that kind of mental and emotional and political agility in a multicultural world, think again about the important big idea of humanistic engagement. So as I say, cultural agents began by looking at Antanas Mokus in Bogotá, Augusto Boal, who made interactive theater an international phenomenon in his lifetime. Great figures. Uh, we looked at uh, Cicero defending his teachers. We looked at Voltaire, who was impatient with scholarship that had no purpose, because for him, scholarship, of course, was part of an enlightened project. We looked at Rousseau, we looked at Gramsci, we looked at great figures. But then I met, in Lima, Peru, several young people your age, young people the age of 20, 21, 22, who were doing something extraordinary with probably less talent than those great figures and less breadth because they didn't have the audience yet, but with quite as much depth and they changed my practice as a teacher. These young people had founded a publishing house that made new books out of old cardboard, used cardboard, and sold those books for almost nothing in the neighborhood. When they realized that people weren't buying these books, even though they were very pretty and very cheap, they realized that in Lima, Peru, unlike Buenos Aires, where this tradition began, people don't read. Now, what happens to a society when people don't read? Development doesn't continue. Still, levels of reading and writing are good indicators for all kinds of development, political, psychosocial, economic. And so reading and writing is a responsibility for all of us to multiply. If we're serious about improving uh, our world, addressing major issues of hunger, inequality, uh, medical, um, the absence of medical care in many areas, uh, reading and writing skills that we can multiply because we are good readers and writers are immediate contributions. This initiative in Lima decided that to make books, they would have to make readers. 
and they taught me how to make readers. I was stunned because I had been teaching for far longer than they had been alive. What they did, and what we do now at Harvard University, and in the immediate area of Boston, and also all over Latin America, and now in Hong Kong and Zimbabwe, just to start outside of Latin America, is we teach teachers how to use a text as raw material for making art. Again, art is new, interpretation changes paradigms, and when you get teachers to allow students to make art from difficult texts, you get very close readers and you get very innovative critics. So I end the big idea of culture changing the world with this very precise and simple to multiply activity called Pretext, which is part of the Cultural Agents uh, Initiative, and it's an invitation to change the world by doing what we know how to do best, which is to learn and to teach. Thank you.